she was always, you know, peppy and alive and smiling, and we would always have a lot of fun together. Linda Fisher took the witness stand heartbroken, sharing memories of her daughter, Michelle Young. She was involved in a language club. She wanted a large school. She would have loved to cheer. We did the road trip, came to NC State, and loved it. Michelle graduated from North Carolina State, went on to get a master's degree, and started a career in accounting. On October 10, 2003, Michelle married Jason Young. A few months later, they had their first child, a beautiful little girl they named Cassidy. She was a great mother. <laughs> I love you, Mommy. I love you, too. With a baby girl and a husband, Michelle was living her dream. Michelle always wanted to be married, have a family. And that family was growing. In November 2006, Michelle and Jason were preparing for their second child, a boy they planned to name Rylan. Then, tragedy struck. I think my sister's dead. Oh my God. On November 3rd, 2006, Michelle's sister Meredith found Michelle face down in a pool of blood. Two-year-old Cassidy had placed a baby doll next to her mother's body. Police found the toddler's bloody footprints all over the scene. Please, do you know what happened to Mama? Did she fall? Is that mm -hmm. everywhere? Emergency officials rushed to Michelle's house, but it was too late. The killer had beaten her so badly, her jaw was broken, her skull was fractured, and several of her teeth were knocked out. Days passed without an arrest. Then months. Finally, three years later, prosecutors charged Michelle's husband, Jason, with murder. He admits their relationship was rocky and that he cheated on Michelle, but he says that's the only thing he's guilty of. Were you there when it happened? No, sir. Do you know who did it? No, sir. You have, did you have anything to do with killing her? No, sir. Let's bring in criminal defense attorney Anna Smith. She's in Raleigh. She's followed both of these cases. Ms. Smith, thank you so much for taking the time to be with us today. Thank you. Sure. So, general, I just want to ask you generally, uh, since you followed both of these cases, how do you think it's going for the defense up to this point? Well, I think it's very important to remember that there is no direct evidence leading this defendant to this murder. And that's just very hard for any prosecution to overcome. It's also hard to overcome that there's six unidentified prints that are within that home that are not related to the defendant. And so that's hard for any prosecution to overcome. Well, if you were defending him, would you put him back on the stand as he was put on the stand in the first trial? I probably would. Um, as the old saying says, don't broke something that's uh, don't fix something that's not broken and they did it right the first time and you know they got eight jurors to believe that he was not guilty and he did testify so i assume that they're probably going to do that same strategy there are so many things though that just don't add up about jason young i think to a lot of people and one of the biggest is the fact that two-year-old cassidy was in that home most likely saw something and was not injured at all nor was the dog who was barking. How, and the fact that he never spoke to attorneys, uh, even asked, he never inquired about the investigation, he never asked whether uh, they were close to finding out who did this to his wife. He never even asked them when they talked to him initially and told him that his wife was dead, he never asked how his two-year-old daughter was. How, from a defense standpoint, do you overcome some of that, which, you know, when I talk, when I listen to people on Facebook and Twitter, those are some of the things they have the hardest time reconciling. Well, and I certainly understand those concerns. Um, however, of course, I am a defense attorney, but it's my understanding through listening to some of the testimony that he was instructed by his attorneys immediately not to speak to anyone, including that of his family, um, and that he was certain just simply complying with their request. So with that being said, it's not that unusual, although to you know someone outside of the legal field it may seem so. Well, as I understand it, he actually had not hired an attorney yet when he refused to speak to investigators and he actually hung up on them. How do you explain that away? Because some people may interpret that as guilty. 
And you're exactly right, some may do that. My understanding and the testimony that I've heard um, actually in the courtroom is that when he returned from Virginia um, immediately to the sister-in-law's house, that while he was there, investigators come to, came to speak to him there and he simply denied you know, any, any right or conversations with them that he had already contacted an attorney. So that was my, my first um, inkling that he had already spoken with an attorney just upon his arrival back from Virginia. Mm -hmm. One of the, and, and I know you watched the first trial, one of the new elements of this case was the uh, testimony we've been talking about this morning from the daycare workers and what they observed about two-year-old Cassidy just days after her mother had been murdered. Uh, how do you counter some of what they're saying came out of a two and a half year old's mouth. I'm sorry, could you repeat that one more time, please? No problem. How, how do you counter, from a defense standpoint, what the daycare workers said about two year old Cassidy role playing about somebody beating up her mommy? Well, it certainly was an emotional card for the jury. I mean, to hear that a, a child you know, two years old may have seen her mother being murdered. Um, I do think it was important that the judge limited that instruction to say this is not for identification purposes. She never indicated it was her father, which she could have. She never used the male doll that was there as an option while she illustrated. Um, and so it's simply that she may have witnessed it and that the, the assailant knew that she witnessed it and may have left her unharmed. I don't necessarily agree with that. I do believe that if someone's intent was, came into the home to murder the mother, there may be several people that would have left an innocent two-year-old unscathed. And that's funny because a lot of investigators, or specifically Mike Brooks, uh, who, who consults with us, he, uh, he's an analyst and says he does not believe, based on his experience, yes, there are people who would not hurt a child, but to go in and hurt and murder so brutally somebody the way that she was murdered you have to discount robbery as a motive here and it only makes it more perplexing that they would not do something to the one and only witness what do you say to that um, and I believe he said I apologize it's a little hard to hear but um, that you said did they discount a robbery I think it was I think it was interesting yesterday that some of the testimony was that in the search warrants when they were applying in the affidavits that they were looking for certain pieces of jewelry that were located, should have been located in the home, such as a, a ring, um, I believe there was a white gold bracelet, and some other extensive items of jewelry that they expected to find in the marital home. And they never did. And they didn't find them through the search warrants of um, Jason Young's mother, his sister's house, um, or anywhere else. So I guess it's possible that those items were actually taken from the home at the time of the murder. Okay, thank you so much. It was so good to have, uh, have you with us, Anna. I appreciate your time this morning. Thank you so much. Sure. Huge day here on In